rabble in arms. Hello, Johnny. Who's there? John Smith, I believe. That's right. Who are you? I'm a Smith, too. Jonathan Smith. Well, I locked the window. You must have got in here before me. <laughs> a long time before. You one of them? Them who? Oh, these ain't hippie clothes. This is what I wore back in uh, Salem. When? 1770s. What kind of put on is it? Put on? That's right, a gag or a joke. This ain't no joke. Well, you look like... Like you? Could be. I'm your great, 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 great grandfather, Johnny. Oh, I gotta be dreaming this. You're crazy. Or I am. The whole world's gone crazy if you ask me. Them young yehoots out there on the cabin. Common. Uh oh, you mean the campus. <laughs> Milling around like a, you're a bunch of young Shawnees trying to work themselves up on the warpath. Where are they heading this way? But they don't know where they're heading any of the time. That's the crazy part of it. No, no, I mean tonight. Near as I could tell, they were trying to think up something to burn. I did hear mention the, uh, the college library. Uh, is this, uh, is this it? Yeah, this is it. Well, then you're helping him. No. <laughs> then you're getting him. No, not really. Now, look, son. You can't stand on both sides of the fence at once. <laughs> you can't be my great, great, well, whatever you say. Well, you're younger than I am. Well, might, maybe. I was just 20 when I was killed, Johnny. For Ticonderogi. Oh. My son, less than two months old. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I, I was luckier, I guess. I was in uh, Vietnam. But I gotta get back to my studying, okay? Ah, uh, it's a funny thing. About being killed, I mean. If I had my druthers, I'd rather live for something than die for something. But what make me sorriest of all would be to find out I died for nothing. What do you mean? Oh, we were powwowing about this on the other side lately. In the spirit world. We were just folks, us colonists. A rabble, Burgoyne called us. <laughs> of course, our lives wouldn't hold a candle to what all you got, but um, we appreciated it just the same. Sometimes I think a heap more and, well, Never mind. As I was saying, we were, we were talking about this country, these United States of America. We gave our lives to start, and uh, was it worth it? Well, some of us have come back to find out. We just don't stomach a bunch of hooligans trying to tear down what we gave our lives to build. And you know something? We're even disgusted at the rest of you for letting them do it. Cool it, Pop. Grandpop to you. Or Jonathan, if you want. Okay. Jonathan. I told you I wasn't for him. But you weren't against him. Well, I haven't made up my mind yet. <laughs> what is there to ponder about? What's your father say? You talk it over with him. My father. <laughs> I haven't seen him since high school. He just took off one day, and it was that. I'm sorry, I didn't know. That's okay. I'm getting over it. Mom's remarried, though. This time to a real no-good Nick. That's when I left home. Well, in our day, home was about all we had. And our religion, of course. Family life was our way of life. Our family and our religion, 
They kept us straight. If a fellow wanted to go wrong, he had to work at it. But today, well, home just doesn't seem like home anymore. <laughs> Who needs it? Not me. That's because you haven't found the right girl. <laughs> I've found dozens of them. But why keep a cow when uh, milk's so cheap, huh? Now, don't talk like that, Johnny. Oh, I reckon it's hard not to be bitter over a broken home. But you are responsible for you. Besides, you're a stripe above those rowdies out there. You don't have to sink to their level. They're young yet. They do and say a lot of crazy kid stuff. But that's what they are. They're just kids. Even so, they, what they come up with makes a lot of sense. Look, you are revolutionary. Well, they're revolutionaries. What did you say? You're, you're, you're calling us look like a rabble? Well, God knows. Most of these kids don't look like anything human. You're right, Johnny. God does know. And he's been real patient about it so far, don't you think? But don't compare that riffraff to your founding fathers. We were making a place where people could worship God. And these people want to deny God and want to deny him to others. And what do they offer instead? We thought of only building something. And these people think of only what they can destroy. And again, I say, what do they offer in its place? Well, they say, in order to build a better world, you've got to destroy this one. <laughs> and that's one of the things they say you think makes sense. Look, uh, I've got to find a book up there for this paper I'm writing. If we have any visitors, they're likely to come in this way. The door's locked, but you never can tell. Would you mind standing guard over the door while I'm up there? If you hear anybody fooling around, well, uh, give me a whistle, okay? Sure. So what are some of the better things they're going to build for you? All right. Name me just one. Well, plenty of things could be better in this country. That's right. Plenty of things are sight better than they were. But what I want is for you to name me one thing that is better in any other country than it is right here. Especially in them countries that that gang out there claims to admire so much. Countries like uh, communist Russia and China. Look, I keep saying they're only kids. Well, stop saying it. This nation was founded by young people. When we think of our pilgrim fathers, we think of old men with gray beards. <laughs> well, most of the people that came over in the Mayflower were in their 20s. Many were even teenagers. Captain John Smith, my ancestor and yours was in his 20s when he was founder and president of the Virginia colony. And George Washington was 22 when he was colonel of the, the British Army during the French and Indian Wars. And oh yes, on the boat that followed the Mayflower over, there was a, a young lad of 19, I believe, Philip Delanoy. Now, one of his descendants became president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> but the founding father was only 19. That I had forgotten, that they were kids too. Mm, no, they, let's say they were young people. <laughs> There's a difference. They were young people who believed in God. Now, the weirdos of today, they deny God. And you know why, don't you? They have to. Because as long as people believe in God, then... Shh. What's that? Oh, it's you, John. Good evening, Dr. Hardin. Hello, oh, I uh, saw the light. Well, I'm uh, knocking out a paper on heartbeats of uh, turtles. Huh, with a baseball bat? Oh, well, uh, I saw it outside the field house on my way over here. Well, I heard some voices. I thought maybe someone was in here with you. What's this? What is it? Yeah, but it's a pine tree coat button, like men used to wear in the revolutionary days. I suppose it came off of one of those hippies' costumes or something, huh? Thought maybe some of those SDSers might be in here. You know, the students for a dirtier society. Got a tip that uh, they might try and sneak in here and vandalize the place, you know? So you didn't hear anything about that, did you? Of course, I know you're not one of them. Oh. Heard a little something, nothing definite. Why didn't you report it? Look, I'm no stool pigeon. <laughs> well, I guess you had something in mind, huh? No. Not as long as they stay out of this room. Oh? 
Look, there are a lot of rare medical books up there. That we use in pre-med. They're not only valuable, they're irreplaceable. And I'm not going to let anybody burn them. You think you can stop them by yourself? They've got to come up this way. And they've got to come up one at a time. Well, maybe you can do it alone. What about the rest of the library? That's not my responsibility. Oh, and this is, huh? Well, this is different. In what way? It makes a difference whose office is God. What did you say? I didn't say it. He did. Who are you? You're one of them out there? <laughs> Mister, that's a question. I get mighty tired of answering, if you don't mind. He's a, a distant relative of mine. Jonathan Smith, Professor Harden, History Department. Oh, Jonathan, I, I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> pardon me, Professor. What was it you were saying about whose ox is being gored? Well, it's an old saying. When trouble hits somebody else, we say it's too bad, but we bear up under it. But let the same thing happen to us. Well, <laughs> that's a different story. We try to do something about it. Your relative's right, you know, John. Well, there's more to it than that. I mean, there's certain rights involved here I happen to believe in. Well, I may not agree with everything they say, but uh, what's the clarion rest of it? I'll defend their right to say it. Well, that's what democracy's all about, isn't it? I mean, free speech, including the right of dissent, and human rights over property rights. All right? Oh, boy. <laughs> if you ever heard such bunkum, read your constitution. There it is. You see, that's the irony of it, Jonathan. They always piously invoke the very constitution they want to destroy. And furthermore... Wait just a minute, John. Look, if we're, if we're going to have any kind of a meaningful dialogue here, then I can't let you just spell out a mouthful like that and go away and leave it, okay? Right on. There are these rights you were talking about? Human rights over property rights. What human rights are violated by this library being here? And what possible human rights could be furthered by destroying it? Well, it'll, it'll shake people up, call attention to other people's needs. What people? What needs? You say pre-med needs? Right, well, pre-med only makes up one part of this university. What about the law students? What about the, the scientists, the engineers, the political economists? Hmm? I mean, they all have a need for this facility. The property of the building was built. The, the books carefully accumulated from the contributions of, of thousands of people who will never even see them. Ordinary people, older people mostly, who gave their money for what? For what purpose? So that you and other young people like you today, next year, years to come, can help to find a better education, to live a better life. And what makes you think you can disassociate your property rights from human rights anyway? You see, John, you don't have to own property to have property rights in it. Hmm? All right, you're studying now to be a doctor, right? That means you'll be interning at some hospital around. And there you'll be working with equipment costing millions of dollars. Millions. I mean, I have to mine a, what, a two million volt x-ray therapy machine costing, what, I don't know, $150,000. Now, wouldn't it be a serious infraction of both your property rights and your human rights if that wonderful machine were destroyed just to shake people up, wouldn't it? Maybe I ought to give you a closer to home, more practical example of what I mean. Take what happened right here in Clovis last summer. The riots, the burning, the looting. A lot of stores were destroyed there. Among them, a, a drugstore, a grocery store, and a five and ten cents. Now, those stores have not been rebuilt. Now, the senseless, irresponsible destruction of those properties was a far greater blow to the human rights of the people of that community. That was unfortunate. You know what they say. You're going to make an omelet, you're going to break a few eggs. Oh, John. Sure. Yeah. And I've noticed the ones who say it, it's not their eggs. They're not talking about just breaking a few little eggs. They're talking about smashing human lives. And they call it the, the right of dissent. 
Sure, we have a right of dissent in America. You realize how much dissent you would dare voice if you lived in Russia or, or China, or one of the other communist countries that they profess to admire so much? One little peep, bang, <laughs> kaput. Sure, the right of dissent is a very real and precious part of America. Its power has helped bring about some of our most cherished social and economic advances. But even in America, the right of dissent is not the right to destroy. I mean, if a goal is holy, you only debase it in the eyes of the world if you, if you stoop to unholy acts to attain it. You call free speech an unholy act? Free speech. It's a beautiful concept that's been deliberately fouled up. Freedom of speech is now freedom of filth. I agree. <laughs> They're throwing abuse, not bullets. I mean, words never hurt anybody. John, if you believe that, you are nuts. Words a lot less lethal have hurt plenty. You remember the crowd in the street looking up at the man on the, the ledge of a tall building? Inside, his wife and his priest were pleading with him to come back in. And down below, the crowd was chanting, Jump, 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 jump. You know what happened? He jumped. The words killed him. And the people down below shouting those words were murderous. And what's happening on high school and college campuses, huh? That should be more shooting than looting. That's the only thing I agree with. Black folks are trying to loot when they should be shooting. If you're gonna loot, loot your gun store. Rabble rousers like Rap Brown calling on student bodies to carry guns. Well, as you can see, words breed guns and more guns, and retaliatory guns, and bombs, and killing. All part of this freedom of filth. Filthy language no decent person would speak, filthy books and magazines no decent person would read, and filthy movies and stage shows no, no decent person would sit through. All of this filth. To what purpose? Fast buck, I suppose. No, no, that's not the purpose, that's the, the lure. Lure? Sure. But the single, all-out, deadly purpose is the destruction of this country. See, our enemies, headed and masterminded by worldwide communists, they found out that they can't destroy us from without until first they weaken us from within. And John, they think they can do it. They have every reason to think so. Historian Arnold Toynbee points out that's how 19 out of 21 nations have gone down the drain before us. Internal decay. The breakdown of moral, ethical, and religious principles. That's what I tried to tell him. The ragtags have to deny God. Because as long as people believe in God and his laws of decency, then they won't go along with what these lowlives want to do. To create an atmosphere of general acceptance to all kinds of degeneration. And to sell their propaganda, they need a lure. The fast buck, huh? It's lure enough for certain types of publishers, uh, producers. Then for the younger generation, the lure, of course, is free sex. Because it makes light of marriage and breaks down the institution of the home quicker than anything else. Instead of love, honor, and cherish, as long as you both shall live, it's, you know, let's, let's shack up, baby, as long as you please me sexually, or as long as you pay the bill, or until uh, someone else comes along that I like uh, just as much. Oh, uh, Doc, your bucket won't hold water. Come again? You paint, uh... Paint free sex too black and married sex too white. But forget what I think personally, but what you think. Your own university doesn't agree with you. Here. Here's this year's catalog. Turn to page 27. <laughs> I know what it says on page 27, or rather what it doesn't say. Right. And it only took two years. Now, two years ago, the students demanded and got student representatives on various governing boards. And soon after, the rule was changed to permit men and women to room in the same dormitories. 
Now this year, the Student Faculty Housing Board voted to drop the rule against cohabitation, premarital sex, and overnight visiting. So whether you like the idea or not, Doc, a lot of us guys and gals think that uh, sleeping together because you, you want to is a lot better than sleeping together because you're supposed to, no matter what any of you uh, married hypocrites may say. Oh, there are no hypocrites in this free love commune of yours, huh? Come on, get off it, John. You know, these guys are only in there to grab what they can as long as it's free, with no responsibilities on them, no protection for the girl, no commitments to each other. They know that a marriage license means a, a legal contract. And what's that? I'll tell you what it is. It's nothing. For years, we had a football coach here, Coach Bland. And he's the reason I, reason I came here instead of state. Well, I looked up to Coach Blandon, not only as a coach, but as a man. Well, last year he signed a new five-year contract. And this year the pros offer him something better, and bam, like a rabbit, he takes off. Well, he jumped his contract, his legal contract, and left us just like that. <laughs> so don't talk to me about honoring contracts, hmm? John, you have every reason to admire Coach Blandon. He's every inch the man you thought he was. Mm -hmm. And there are certain circumstances I could explain to you sometime when you're not engaged with that cigarette. This? Yeah, it is marijuana, isn't it? It's only a question of time before it's legalized. <laughs> it's not smack, you know. I don't go for heroin. No, no one goes directly to heroin. But nearly everyone on heroin started with marijuana. That's why there are people that want to legalize marijuana. Well, they figure if they can get the young people of this country on to hard drugs, they can destroy your generation or in this generation. Now, Doc, let us not get up tight. <laughs> the drugs have already gotten a frightening hold in this country, mostly on our young people. Drugs are the reason why our crime rate is climbing ten times faster than our population. Well, this is a nation that's in serious trouble. Well, I hope you're not blaming young people for all of it. Have you ever heard of unemployment? Most young people can't even buy jobs. For years we've been told, Get a college education. To get good jobs, you need an academic degree. Well, academic degrees are lucky to be sweeping floors, and that's not our fault. You said it. This world's in bad shape. Well, it's a world we never made. <laughs> oh, and America wants to make love, not war. <laughs> wow. Well, so who doesn't? But they still want high wages that go along with wartime jobs. And all the while, the national debt's going up and up and up and up. And you want to cop out and leave it as a legacy to our generation to pay for it. You bleed about this country being in serious trouble. Well, wake up, Doc. This country's already over the brink. It's down the drain. You talk about an America that, that no longer exists. Get up! Get sit down, Doc. What did you say? I said sit down. Those are our commandos out there. They're in the building now. Wrecking the place. Don't, don't try it, Doc. Don't be a hero with a broken head. You know what they'll do to all of you for doing this, huh? Sure. <laughs> Nothing. They never do. We're legal dissenters, didn't you know? <laughs> Hear that out there? That's your generation going down out there. Don't fool yourself into thinking that we're just a few. <laughs> No, we've got chapters on more than 200 campuses. And we've got more than 40,000 members, a bunch of them right out there. Some on your faculty. But you keep believing it. You keep saying it's only a few. It helps you sleep any better. Gives you an excuse not to do anything, doesn't it? Well, that's what we're counting on. Your beautiful gullibility. Your stupid do-nothing about it. That all helps us wreck your establishment. Baby, we are the new revolutionaries. Jonathan, where'd you get that? Don't tell me you brought it with you. <laughs> nope. Found it in the museum. No pad or shot, though. 